the audience namaste in today's american conversations we have ms tracy reed ms tracy reed is such a firefighter at fairfax county fire department who commutes to work every day for about 1 hour and 15 minutes from fredericksburg to northern virginia and she has two kids of her own under 5 years of age she currently is a captain at the department and she holds a science biology degree from university of mary washington and during the free time she teaches the emergency medicine uh, at a local hospital and at the same time she shares her expertise with the aspiring writers um, at a local library ms tracy reed decided to go to nepal with 49 members of fairfax search and rescue squad soon after the earthquake hit the himalayan nation on april 25 leaving the two young children behind her and other community commitments while we express our deepest and sincerest of our thanks and gratitude during this time of crisis that she chose to go to nepal we also were honored by ms reed as she gave us this time to talk to us and and share her experience as well she was uh, in the rescue mission while working in nepal the audience please welcome ms reed welcome to the american conversations thank you we are very much uh, thankful to you for giving us this time to talk to us and to our audience and share your experiences while you were in nepal in those times of uh, greatest need when nepalese were under very difficult circumstances because of the earthquake that happened in april 25 very honored to be here thank you how is it that um, you were able to go to nepal when you had two kids of under 5 years of age uh, that you decided to go to nepal yeah it was a pretty easy decision actually for me um my story started back when i was 14 My dad was working on a car and opened the radiator cap and the radiator fluid was still hot and it came out of the engine and he ran but it burned him on his back and I was outside and I saw it happen and I remember just being panicked because I didn't know what to do and we called 911 and the ambulance came and they were very calm and they comforted him and they took care of him and he went to the hospital and when he came back he seemed to be fine in my you know teenage opinion And I knew then I said that's what I want to do. I want to help people. How old were you then? 14. 14. And so when I turned 16, I learned the local rescue squad taught the EMT, the emergency medical technician class, and you could do it when you were only 16 years old. And I thought that was amazing. I thought you had to wait till I go to college and medical school and here I could be 16 and I could help people and I took the class and I I loved it. I loved being so young and being able to make a a difference in the world. And so I've been doing it ever since. I volunteered and then I got a career job. My husband pretty much the same path. He graduated high school, he joined the local rescue squad and fire department. So we're both and now Oh, you're in the same department, both of you. Not now. He's um actually works for the he's a law enforcement. So oh, okay. he works for the police department. So both of us our whole careers, him since he was probably 19 years old and me since I was 16 have been involved with either emergency medicine, firefighting or law enforcement. And so it's it's deeply ingrained in us to help other people. And so it was an easy decision and he was very supportive when it came up. Of course, you know, go and I'll take care of everything. He does search and rescue in Stafford. And so they call and say, "Hey, we have a missing child or we have a missing elderly person." And no problem, he says, "I got to go." And I say, "Okay." So uh, we're it's kind of our exciting life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, so it's not something like um difficult situation to decide so it no. was like okay very easy and my we're very lucky like you said the community my sister lives nearby our parents live nearby so our neighbors are great so it's a community involvement for us to be able to do these things if he has to work it's well who's going to pick the kids up and neighbors volunteer to pick the kids up or 
Uh, my son had his sixth birthday while I was gone, and all the oh neighborhood kids came over to have a birthday party for him since I was gone. And so, yeah, it, every, it really takes a community. We couldn't do it alone. It's not about me. It's like you said, it's about all of them, too. Yeah. Absolutely. You are such a lucky person to yes. have such a beautiful <laughs> family around uh, where you live. Yes, we are very fortunate. Exactly. Uh, how are you doing after you returned uh, from uh, your mission in Nepal? Wonderful. The time change is a little different, getting mm -hmm. used to the, it was a long plane ride, um, but once you kind of got caught up on the sleep and the excitement of everything, I'll admit it was a little hard to adjust because I missed the people. When you're with your team for three weeks, day in, day out, you eat, sleep, live together, and you're around the Nepali community the whole time, and then you just leave all of a sudden, you're grateful to see your family, but you also still wonder about the people you met and how they're doing, and you just miss that bond with them. Almost three weeks' time, you had already developed a bond with the Nepalese there? Yes. Yeah, so, and one, a good example of it, the drivers um, that we had, the, they volunteered to come and drive for us different places we needed to go. And one of our team members went out and saw them doing something in the dirt one day. And so he went over and started talking to him and said, what are you guys doing? And he said, oh, we're playing this Nepali game, Tigers and Goats. Uh -huh. He said, oh, can you show me? And so he showed... Like a chess game, right? Yes. And <laughs> so he showed him how to play Tigers and Goats. And then he came back and he taught all of us. And... It was a big thing. Everybody was learning tigers and goats. I came back and taught my kids how to oh, play tigers and goats. And Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. So my son's, can we play tigers and goats? My daughter is two and a half. And so she calls it cows and dinosaurs. I don't know why. She's a little confused. <laughs> but, yeah, so that bond of. Yeah, that's, that's what we um, played uh, during our childhood, too. Okay. Yeah, so you have this, this life-changing, this, you know, huge, disastrous event. But we're still able to find some common bond and kind of you know, lighthearted. It's the human nature that connects yeah, and, you. And be, and be communicating. And be communicating with people you can barely, you know, English, you don't, it transcends language. Yeah. It transcends nationality and religion. It's just being humans. Could you have said, no, I've got two kids. I, want, I don't want to go all that far to uh, do the rescue work. Uh, uh, when someone called you from Fairfax Fire Department, uh, when the earthquake happened? Yes. Um, we were actually on a drill when it happened and so they said can anybody not go there's a possibility we may be going if you cannot go let us know and I called my husband and again we talked hey is there anything major do you see why I couldn't do this and he said absolutely not you know go ahead and go so there is an option but that's why I'm on the team to go and I waited to get on the team until my children were a little older if I had an infant I think it would have been a little harder to leave yeah. but I I think they're they've spent time away from us um, I work 24-hour shifts, so when I'm gone, I'm gone for 24 hours. So they're a little used to that. Of course, this was a lot longer than that, but I knew they would be okay. So to me, there was no hesitation. There was no question. So you could have said no, but still you said yes. Yes. So what is it that, uh, that made you to say yes? It's like I told my son. I said, uh, you, you partly answered that question, but still... He says, um, I, we're trying to teach him and instill the same values of taking care of others and doing things for others. And I tell him, you know, people help us when we need something, whether it's we don't have any eggs left and we are making a cake and the neighbor gives us an egg or um, in the winter our car slid into a ditch and a tow truck came and pulled us out. People, when we needed help, people came and helped us. And now the people of Nepal need help, so mommy's going to help them. And it's so just kids, that simple. Your kids also, you know... Uh, the, said that. My, yes, my six-year-old, now six-year-old. Isn't that beautiful? And he looked at, he, my sister told him on the globe where Nepal was, and so he showed me, Mom, I know you were right here. You know, did you fly this way around the world or this way? And so he asked questions, and he understood a little bit. Just the simple fact, you're just going to help people. People need you, and we go. So when you were in Kathmandu, um, did you ever contact your family, and did you ever talk to your kids uh, over telephone or... Yes, we got to call. Um, we call everybody called for Mother's Day, and oh, so yeah. that was, Mother's Day was that time too, we missed yeah. Mother's Day. Um, and then I called him on his birthday when I missed his birthday. So, and he was great. He said, uh, "We have we're having a birthday party with the neighborhood kids." And I said, "Oh, well, we can have another birthday party when mommy gets home and this weekend." And he said, "Well, then I'll be seven. And I said, "Well, not exactly. You'll still be <laughs> six, but you just get two birthday parties." So, <laughs> it's beautiful. Was that your first trip to a foreign country on a, uh, a rescue and search, search and rescue mission? Or? Yes, because I told them I have you know, one of the best stories on the team. 
prior to this, the team had not gone on an international deployment in five years. So sometimes they're very spread apart. You don't know when the next disaster is going to be, and it could be a long time. I got on the team in December, and then you have to go through a lot of training and um, issues with your immunizations and your passport, and all that takes time. And so Tuesday, I got deployable. We were started a drill on Friday. The earthquake happened on Saturday, yes. and we left. So I had not been deployable less than a week. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I was like, I'm getting my first drill and my first international deployment in a matter of days, which was just amazing. But I was brand new, yeah. brand like the definitely the newest person. But you on the got your visas um, stamped at the airport, I guess. Yes, just yeah. go, you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> learn as you go, kind of. Exactly, thing. yeah. Tell us about the most touching thing that uh, you came across when you were uh, doing the search and rescue mission in Nepal. It would have had times. to undoubtedly be when the 15-year-old boy was rescued from that building. It was just. A miracle. I don't know how else you say it. They um, they said they were actually digging the building out as part, just demolishing it. And the person working the crane, the um, bulldozer, took a break to get a drink or something. And when he turned the machine off, he heard the screaming. And it was only because he had turned the machine, he could have left enough. the keys in it, he could have left it running. But he turned it off and they, they heard something. And so the um, Nepali Armed Forces and the Nepali Police they found him or they heard him and we got word that there was something going on and so we went over to offer assistance and it was just them there were hundreds of nepali armed forces nepali police other teams just nepali people all gathered around the all the way out was in the little alley and so they were lining the ring road as we pulled up i mean hundreds and hundreds of people and so to watch everybody work together with very little tools and it was probably if you look at the pictures, like six or seven floors down, that he was in a very small space. And it was just amazing that he was alive and that he was talking. And when he came out, he um, said something about he had given up hope. And that somebody was said, so many hours. Right, yeah, yeah, seven days, five days. I have yeah. to look at, but several yeah. days. Yeah, several and, days. Yeah, Tuesday was. And uh, he said, you know, that's, and people said that's what these teams do, is they bring hope. And I mean, what an amazing gift to bring, you know, exactly. and you can send money and things, but to bring hope, that's truly amazing. And so that was a very touching moment when, when he came out, I mean, just, I would say it's like a rebirth. It's almost like watching a baby boom born. They pulled him out of that concrete and he was alive and they kind of held him up and moved him. Just people passed down and they were clapping and cheering and into the vehicle waiting to take him to the hospital. It was just amazing. I couldn't imagine what his family had thought and how they were feeling. These things happen in, in the remotest uh, area uh, of the world uh, or the farthest area of the world. Um, how difficult was it uh, to do the rescue operations in those concrete uh, buildings? Because um, over here it's kind of little, you, you have equipments yes. you know, and uh, things go pretty fast uh, and then lives are you know, brought to, you know, normal situations again. How difficult was it uh, to work out there in the, in the, in the rubbles? It's pretty difficult, um, but that's what we train for. And we have a facility in Lorton uh -huh. uh, where we have concrete piles and rub we call it rubble piles where we practice, where we collapse like a parking garage or um, they just built one with an elevator shaft or things like that. They simulate vehicles falling in large amounts of debris and concrete, and then they tunnel in to go get victims or mannequins or whatever you know they're using and so we practice doing it with very limited equipment and the like I said the good the good part of this I guess is that we were practicing for a drill on Friday morning we got deployed and we went to Lorton and we were pretending it was a 2007 earthquake in Peru mm -hmm. and so we're doing the drill and going through all the scenarios and it was Saturday morning we'd been up all night everybody had been working all night on this drill site it was supposed to be a three-day drill Saturday morning, they, people started saying, why, there's been an earthquake. I said, yeah, that's the drill, an earthquake in Peru. And they said, no, a real earthquake in Nepal. And we were like, oh, uh, just the irony of we were ready. Everybody was there, all our equipment. We had just been practicing. So just and to pack just it up, get on an airplane and leave. And it was, we were right in it. We had just done it. And so that's what we trained for is just to use hand tools. 
Um, the vehicles, you know, we don't have a big vehicles. We get whatever we can get. So if it's a pickup truck there or if it's an SUV, we just fit as many people and tools as we can get. They pick out the tools that they need the most, and we just drive to wherever we need to go. On, until Friday, you were training. Yes. Uh, the same kind of rescue operations. The imagine, exact same in thing. Peru. On Monday, um, you disembarked from the airport. What, what kind of feelings were racing through your mind? Uh, were you scared about, uh, you know? I or... was never scared. I was more nervous. Are we here in time? Because that's the farthest I think the team has ever had to go. Yeah, that was my hours first on the air, I guess. Yes, and the whole travel time, I think they said, was 52 hours from when we left because we had stops and things that we had to refuel the jet and things like that. Yeah. And I just, I think the biggest fear I had was, are we here in time? Yeah. Are we going to be able to do anything or is it too late? And so that one boy was just where it's not too late. I mean, you can't hope yeah. in life. You can't put a price on that. It exactly. made it all. We would have loved to have saved more people, yeah. obviously. Yeah, but, if you were in, yeah. And exactly. we always try, um, but it just, it worked out these circumstances for him. So when we landed, I remember looking around and I'd never been to Kathmandu. And so what are we going to see? How much destruction is there? Um, what are the people going to be like? Uh, are they mad that we got here too late? Or, you know, I didn't know the feeling of it and how dire the situation was going to be. So what kind of relation did you get uh, from the trip, uh, the rescue and uh, source uh, mission in Nepal? I think I learned more about myself. Okay, Through the Nepali well. people, they're so resilient. I mean, that just there was a story about a woman in a village whose home was made of mud bricks and it collapsed in the earthquake. And she was outside stacking the bricks up again, rebuilding her house. And she wasn't waiting for somebody to come help her. And just they do so much every day with so little. And I think sometimes I personally get caught up here with my cell phone and the computer and the Internet and the power and the you know, all the gadgets and gizmos, and then you get over there and just with hand tools, you're able to save someone and you realize, I don't need all, you know, you don't necessarily need all the things that we have. I mean, you see what they have there, and we talked again to the drivers and the Nepali people, and they told us about um, filtering rainwater on the roofs to have drinking water, and the power is very intermittent and yeah. things like that, and yet they live and they thrive and they smile and they're happy and so it, it really brings me back here and saying okay well what do i need to look at in my own life to be more like that to what's really important what really matters exactly did you ever feel like oh i, I don't really want to go this early when it was time for you to leave nepal and come back here um definitely i think some people were you know ready to go and i was okay that we were there i definitely i miss my family very yeah. much so so yeah. i wanted to come back and see them and i also think it to myself to try to understand it we have a job our job is search and rescue that's what we train in that's what we specialize in that's yeah. what we do and by that point the search efforts had pretty much been stopped they'd said this is no longer a search and rescue it's a recovery and it's a rebuilding yes. phase of this mm -hmm. and i wanted to stay part of me wanted to stay and help because like i said you get to know the people and the culture and everything and you become part you try to become part of that but I realized that there's other groups that do that. That's mm -hmm. what they do. They yeah. come in and they know how to build buildings and food and water and shelter and set all that things. And that's not my specialty. So I have to trust that people who are better trained at that were coming in to do that. Just like they probably wouldn't have been, you know, as comfortable doing search and rescue efforts. So everybody has their piece and everybody is able to contribute. And I think we did what we could to contribute. We did a lot of humanitarian work while we were there, but it was... It's definitely not what we're trained to do, and there were yeah. other people trained to do that. Uh, how, how fortunate do you feel that you were uh, with the fire, uh, Fairfax Fire Department uh, that made you to go there? Very fortunate. The Fairfax, there's only two teams in the yeah. United States that go international, and so LA Los Angeles and Fairfax. and Fairfax, right? And I mean, that's incredible if you think about all the firefighters in the country to get to be one, all the people in the country to not only ever get to go to Nepal, but to get to go to Nepal to help other people, it's amazing. It's a dream come true. That's why I joined Fairfax Fire Department was because of their USAR team. Eventually, I wanted to be on that team. I thought it's one thing to help my community, but now I'm going to try and help people all over the world. Yeah. How did you explain uh, your work uh, in Nepal uh, to your children? 
after you returned? Um, I told them, like I said, you know, I went to help people and we talked about there were some buildings that fell over and some people were in the buildings and so we went to try to help them get out of the buildings and I think my husband was showing them some of the new stuff that was um, on TV so that they could understand a little bit. My two and a half year old, she she didn't really understand. She's too yeah. young. Um, but my five year old now, six year old at the time, he's, he understands that. It's that he knows that daddy leaves on a moment's notice to have to go to work. Mm -hmm. Mommy leaves to have to go to work. So for him, it was just another going away. Another he didn't really realize how far away we were. It was, yeah. if you're here, you're here. If you're not, you're just not here. So whether I was in Fairfax or Nepal to him, it was kind of, you well, you're not of, home. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so he, he wasn't worried. He was very, very proud, very, you know. Do you plan to take your family to Nepal? But yes, I would love to go back. My sister and I, um, she actually works for a group that does AIDS research and prevention all around the country. And so we went to Africa in 2005 on a safari. And as part of our safari, we went for her for a work trip. Uh, we went to the base camp of um, Kilimanjaro, uh -huh. and I said, this, yeah, this yeah. is amazing. I want to come yeah. back and climb it because you can walk up it. It's non-technical. Yeah. Well, the group we went with, a lot of them had done base camp of Everest. And so I said, oh, you have to go do, you know, climb the base camp of Everest. And so I said, well, maybe someday I'll do that. And then I had my kids, and so I didn't want to leave them. So when they said there's been an earthquake in Nepal, and I, oh, my gosh, I've always wanted to go to Nepal. Nepal. I mean, I know we're not going to Everest, but... yeah. Wow, that's, camp. yeah, I'm pretty close, closer than I've ever been. Yeah. And so, yes, I would, a couple of people on the team, we were talking that we would like to go back to see how everything, what, how different it looks and maybe go to the base camp of Everest. But people were talking about trekking in Lang Tang Valley and it's a beautiful, you know, oh, we just stayed in Kathmandu, um, but how much, how beautiful the rest of the country is. And so I'd like to go back. Yeah, the closest um, uh, glacier and the Himalayan rains uh, from Kathmandu Valley is Lankang Valley, and that was one of the worst hit uh, areas uh, by the earthquake. I've been there. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we saw a lot of, we had people that would bring us posters of missing relatives that were hiking, and unfortunately, that's part of it, too, is they would come and they would say, oh, my parents are missing, or so and so, my friend's missing, and we'd say, okay, where are they? And they'd say, Lankang Valley, and... We got a tourist map. We didn't have a map of Kathmandu because when we went, we didn't know exactly where in Nepal we were yeah. going to go. And so we got a tourist map and we said, okay, where's Lang Tang Valley? And they'd say, over here. And we're like, oh, okay, we can't walk there. Is there anything? Yeah. So we kind of have to focus where can we get to? And they said a lot of the roads were impassable. Even on a good day, it would be a six-hour drive. And now you just, yeah. the roads were impassable. So we would hear their stories, but there was nothing we could do. That was something kind of hard they, to deal with. And yeah. we had to refocus on okay, we're going to help the people here. This is our area. Other people are coming, but we, we just can't get there. So. Exactly. So one responder uh, from the Fairfax Fire and Rescue Department told me that uh, he fell in absolute love with Nepal uh, and its people because they were hit so hard by the earthquake and still they would not know why or how or who to be angry with. Uh, was that the sheer virtue of being ignorant or that was the highest level of consciousness about the futility of life that the people of Nepal that you experienced with? Uh, what is your feeling about that? I don't think it was ignorance at all. If anything, I think maybe they're more in tune with nature and life. Um, I take my personal experience. My grandparents and great-grandparents and my husband, they worked on a farm, lived on a farm. The whole family lived in the community. So they understood the life cycle of an animal being raised and then killed and eaten and it nourishes people. And same thing, the family would get older and the older people would get sick and they pass away and they all lived in the community and people saw that. So death was very much a part of life. It was a natural um, part. Versus now, my grandparents got older. You know, we see our parents getting old and they tend to go to nursing homes when they get ill. And so we're very removed from death, I think, in kind of in our culture, at least in my family. So for the people of Nepal, when we talked to the drivers and some of our interpreters and things, they said, well, no, the whole family, like there would be a seven-story building mm -hmm. and the family would leave on each level, aunts, the grandparents. You know. So they're, they're all together and they see people get old and they see people get sick and they see people die and that's an accepted part of their culture versus we tend to kind of shun away from that. So I think when the earthquake happened, they they were digging out by hand. Again, they, they were very resilient. They were doing what they could, but after some point they realized that the people were probably dead and 
they would mourn and move on. So it's almost like they're ahead of us in that level. We would go to the buildings and we'd say, is there anybody in there? And they'd say, well, we heard someone yelling two days ago, but we haven't heard them since. But it didn't, they weren't angry about it. They weren't angry at us for not getting there. And we'd, we'd send the dogs and we'd have cameras and listening devices and we'd try to figure out, you know, and nobody would be alive. But I was, I was actually kind of surprised that, oh, are they going to be mad? Are they going to yell at us? But they were very hospitable. They were very helpful. Well, I don't, I, we never heard anybody in this building, but let me take you to another building. And so we'd just go building to building and the people would lead us around and we'd say, does anybody know where Claps building is? And they'd say, well, let me take you to, the, I don't know, but my friend knows or I heard. And so everything we did was really based on the people help, helping us. Yeah. So yeah, I think they're, like I say, even farther ahead of us. They, they understand life. They understand the process. Um, do you think uh, more lives uh, could have been uh, rescued uh, if uh, people in Nepal uh, were, you know, educated about the uh, the precautions uh, about earthquake, or even after the earthquake happens, the the minimum small things like whistles, uh, if the whistles are um, kept in the house, and if they have it, they you know. They use it so that uh, the rescue people could hear that and then would say, okay, here's a person trapped and let's rescue him. Would that situation have been uh, possible if uh, people in Nepal were adequately uh, informed about those uh, small stuff? We saw that signs that were there beforehand and I didn't know the area. There's a... Um, Apparently it's a fault line and so there's a lot of international training on earthquakes and damage and prevention and the building codes and things like that that had been going on there for a number of years. And we saw poster billboards of what to do if there's an earthquake that were there before the earthquake, we were told. So um, for us, it, I think just our travel time to get there was so long, but they said they heard people yelling, so I don't know that I can answer whether whistles would have... Been, I, I can't imagine it's a bad idea, but... Yeah. So, uh, the Fairfax County is mulling with the USAID, sending, the, uh, another, sending another team to Nepal for recovery and uh, uh, reconstruction efforts. Um, what is your advice to the members of the team who are visiting for the first time in Nepal, like you did visit? It's a third world country, and to try to learn the culture, get to know the people, talk to the people, their experiences, because again, they were a wealth of knowledge for us and telling us, um, well, you know, where's a building collapse? And we go to the building, uh, the, the watering hole was one of the, I guess, local buildings. It was a hotel, and they were able to tell us, well, we already found this many people, and we already moved this pile over here, and so by hand, so much of the work had already been done by hand. Um, and then the culture, part of my job on the team is to research before we go, what's the culture like? So simple things like namaste, learning local greetings or um, how to shake hands. And a lot of the history, even now we come back and we talk to people about, oh, well, did you know the, the history of this or that? Well, I didn't know that while we were there. Uh, the temples, our structural engineers assessed for the seven temples in Kathmandu, and that was a huge honor for them. So to learn the history behind the building of what you're doing, we still treat it with ultimate respect. But then when you come back, you, you learn even more about it. So try to absorb of, as much of the culture and talk to the people because that's really what it's about. It's not about bricks and buildings yeah. and things like that. So that's where you're going to have that, that lasting impression like tigers and goats. You know, it's the simplest yeah. little things. Yeah. Um, do you have something more to add uh, um, to Nepali community members uh, who are living in the United States or, and also to the Nepalese back uh, in Nepal that you wanted to say? I would say thank you. Thank you for all your support. The Nepali people since we've gotten back in our own community have just been outstanding. They were they're meeting us when we got off the bus. They've um, held luncheons for us. They've held fundraisers. And so thank you because the Nepali people are, are close to our hearts. So their fundraising efforts, we feel like you know, anything we can do to help, um, help them because they're helping the people back in Nepal. And to the people of Nepal, thank you for all your hospitality and sharing your lives with us, sharing your stories with us. Thank you so much for uh, being with us thank at the you. American Conversations today. Thank you. Thank you. The audience. 
with this, we'd like to wrap up tonight's American Conversations. Good night and namaste.